Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear and see me okay. We had some minor uh, technical difficulties there for a few minutes, but now we're ready to go uh, and start. And we can also see that we have uh, all our participants uh, left into the room. So uh, welcome to today's session. It is, uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to our TASER session for our new MSc program on aging and public policy. I'm Kieran Walsh, Professor of Aging and Public Policy and Economics at NUI Galway and Director of the Irish Centre for Social Gerontology. We're delighted that you can join us today and we uh, really hope just to give you in this short session just a, a flavour of the programme itself and why it's an important programme for circumstances of ageing societies and their future well-being and indeed issues of sustainability and equity as well. I'm also delighted uh, to be joined today by three of the lecturers from our programme, all of whom are experts in their own right uh, within this field. So first we have Eamon O'Shea, who is Professor of Economics and Director of the Centre for Economic and Social Research in Dementia. Next we have Oni Lema, who is Senior Research Fellow an Associate Director of the Irish Centre for Social Gerontology. And finally, we have Patricia Conboy, who is a consultant and adjunct lecturer with the ICSG and former head of Global Advocacy and Campaigns for Health Age International. But before we outline today's session, I wanted to remind you very briefly about some of the key elements uh, of our programme and why it's, uh, why it's important at this time. So, driven by a commitment to research-led interdisciplinary education, the programme aims to critically examine demographic ageing from a public policy perspective, and in doing so, it assesses existing approaches and future directions to secure effective and fair uh, ageing societies. It's a really important time for ageing and policy, and there are three critical reasons as to why this programme is necessary and is really necessary now. So first, and in almost all regions of the world, populations are ageing, with the number of people aged 65 years and over projected to double by 2050. And this creates sustainability challenges uh, for our systems and institutions and equity challenges for our societies in every major uh, policy domain. Second, a range of international, uh, European and national policy agendas testify not just to the urgency of these challenges, but really importantly to the political commitment to finding innovative means to adapting demographic uh, change. Third, and perhaps more critically, and most critically uh, for you as potential students on this program, there is a marked gap in labour force capacity and skills to help public agencies, civil society organisations and private companies to really address these challenges, but to capitalise on the opportunities within ageing societies. Uh, and, and, and that is a key factor because as a result of this gap, our efforts are often uncoordinated, they're also sometimes ad hoc, and sometimes uh, our policies aren't as effective as they could be. The COVID-19 pandemic has only further really exposed the weaknesses of ageing related policy in this form, and I, I suppose in that way also exposed our neglect of the needs and preferences of heterogeneous uh, older populations. So this is why we want to design an interdis interdisciplinary innovative program uh, that provides topic specific and transferable skill sets through a combination of taught modules, uh, an applied research project and a placement. And that's in order to deliver skill sets in around in-depth knowledge of age-related policy, capacity for critical thinking and theorizing, and the ability to assess and evaluate public policies as well. So these are all key skill sets that are, are very much needed within the aging policy sector. If you enroll in this course, then we would also um, suggest that you would benefit from three distinctive features. And this is really around uh, the fact that this is the first program of its kind uh, in Ireland and one of the first that is available internationally. It's hosted an internationally recognized research center. Uh, so you benefit from state-of-the-art research knowledge being contributing and, and uh, being uh, uh, fed into a key uh, module development. And finally, it's delivered, and very importantly, in collaboration with international policy experts and stakeholders. So 
this brings us to today's session. And what we hope to do is have uh, four mini lectures drawing on some of our core modules and core programs. So first, I will take you through social exclusion and inequality across the life course and some of the critical considerations there. Then Eamon O'Shea will take you through dynamics of aging and public policy, focusing specifically on home care for today's uh, conversation. And then Oni Lema will look at work, pensions and retirements, considering specifically extended working life. And finally, Patricia Conboy will look at international policy in aging and UN sustainable development goals and how this relates to low and middle income countries with respect to exclusion and inclusion. And if we have time at the end, we will have some questions and answers, but certainly feed your questions and answers into the, the chat function as we go along and we'll make sure they're answered uh, either during or after the sessions. Okay, so our MSc in uh, Aging and Public Policy, the first mini lecture is going to focus on exclusion and inequality in later life. And what I really want to do here is to focus on key four, four key areas. Uh, and so this is in relation to one, one aspect uh, is uh, why this is an important topic for aging and policy, what is meant by inequalities and exclusion in later life, and what are some of the unique features of disadvantage in later life as well. And then to consider this in relation to life course and why a life course approach is necessary. If I have time, I am going to draw attention to the last 12 months and what these 12 months with respect to COVID-19 has taught us about our capacity to actually achieve inclusive uh, societies. So why is this important? Well, there has certainly been a general rise in standards of living of older populations uh, in many countries. There is also evidence of increased variation in those living standards and increased variation in the quality and nature of life experiences for different groups of older people. This means that some people's lives are not improving as much as others, if at all, uh, and with growing inequalities amongst older populations in many nations. And this also has occurred amidst not just advanced demographic aging patterns, but also the changing relationships between societies and individuals where provisions, supports, and even employment is less certain and precarious for certain groups and certain cohorts. So therefore, unequal aging has not only impacted on some of the current generation of older people, it is expected to impact on future generations uh, to, a degree, uh, to a greater degree. And certainly this will undermine not just the moral equity of aging societies, but leads to an accumulation of challenges that can be detrimental to households, to communities, and to the effectiveness of policy systems. It'll also undermine our ability to actually be able to implement key policy agendas, such as the UN Sustainable Development Goals, such as uh, goals around healthy and active aging as well. So then, well, if we're considering some of these reasons as to why this topic is important, what, what is meant when we actually use the terms like inequality and exclusion, particularly in relation to older people? Well, starting first with inequalities is a very basic concept. We can describe it as involving deficiencies and discrepancies in the full distribution of well-being across such areas as income, wealth, edu edu education, space, uh, and so on. So what this draws our attention to really is a need to ensure equivalence of resources and rights, the fair distribution of power, the recognition of worth and status of individuals. Now, traditionally, there's always been a focus on uh, inequalities of outcomes and the differences that people can achieve. So income levels, uh, health outcomes, and so on. But the focus has really helpfully evolved to also try and account for inequalities of opportunities. So this refers to differences in people's circumstances with respect to what outcomes can actually be achieved. And over the years, there's also been an expansion in terms of the sort of inequalities that we're interested in. So it's really about multifaceted inequalities now that we really have to try and capture and really have to try and understand. And this brings us to the concept of social exclusion then. And social exclusion is not uh, the same as inequality at all, but it allows us to consider processes and outcomes that construct these inequalities, the ways in which these can uh, change over time, and how different sets of inequalities can contribute to entrenched forms of disadvantage, namely the experience of being uh, excluded. 
So we can think uh, very simply uh, as uh, social exclusion as involving the separation of individuals and groups from mainstream society. And this separation involves material aspects such as goods, resources, employment, so on, but it also involves symbolic aspects where our norms, our practices, our cultural structures can stigmatize, can create positions of disadvantage for different groups as, as well. Okay, so then this brings us to older people and exclusion. And there is a growing evidence that shows that older people can experience exclusion in relation to choice and control, uh, rights and resources, power and rights across a number of key interconnected areas. So this is in terms of economic elements, it's in terms of social elements, it's in terms of services elements, it's in terms of civic participation, neighborhood and community and socio-cultural aspects as well. So uh, this really illustrates uh, why a policy approach has to be comprehensive and multifaceted in understanding older people's participation in society and how to support that, uh, that participation in society as well. As a research concept and as a policy concept, which can be used to develop and underpin policy, certainly social exclusion offers a number of key attributes that are important here. The first is that it relates to how exclusion can be multidimensional, and that's what we can see from this diagram here, is that it's incorporated in different areas of life. The second is that it's dynamic and not static, uh, so it's about the trajectory of individuals and the diversity of individuals across people's lives, but it's also a relative it's relative to where people lived, um, but it's also very much not just about levels of participation, but it's why those levels exist. So it's about the act of exclusion. What is actually creating the need? What is creating uh, perhaps the uh, issues around discrimination, violation of rights, and so on and so forth. So then we can go a little bit further here, though, and we can think about, well, if we've seen why this is important, if we've seen what exclusion later life entails, what is per potentially unique about exclusion and inequalities in later life? Well, first, these exclusions and inequalities can be accumulated over the course of people's individual lives. So this uh, effectively contributes to an increased prevalence of exclusion in older age. Second, as there can be fewer ways for older people to lift themselves out of disadvantage, exclusion can serve as tipping points, knocking people into precarious conditions uh, in, in terms of their older age experiences. And this is really because a lot of societies just rely on labor participation to lift people out of exclusion, which creates a, a problematic dilemma for older populations straight away. Third, some older individuals can simply more, be more vulnerable or susceptible to different forms of exclusion. It's because of age-related health declines, it's because of contracting social and support networks, and it's because of the ways that societies we construct and think about aging and older people as well. So what all of this, very briefly, also draws our attention to is that this is not just about older age, it is about life course and this is the fourth area i really want to bring up so it's about trying to consider early and earlier life experiences and the, the need to intervene earlier in people's lives it's about looking at major transitions throughout people's lives which can serve as sources of adversity and challenge participation so ill health marital and family breakdown accommodation and housing uncertainty but it's also about combating entrenched inequalities for older populations today. So these are marginalized groups. These are uh, people who essentially need good quality health services, adequate pensions, inclusive neighborhoods, environments, and strong platform forms for voice that enable people to express their own needs and their own agency as well. What I really want to leave you with is uh, what COVID-19 perhaps has taught us uh, about our capacity to achieve equitable societies. And there are a, a couple of things here that are really important and really COVID-19 provides a very concerning but a useful global example um, of the need to attend to the sort of interplay between policy and exclusion. So really it, it has uh, helped illuminate some of uh, these long-standing truths that we see within our society. And I'm going to only really um, 
uh, briefly can run through these. So the first is our conception of aging is still locked within the health framing. And this is despite the significant shift to biopsychosocial models of aging. And this means that it's a little bit harder to implement uh, holistic, comprehensive policy agendas for older people and to develop inclusive and social equality goals for older people as well. Second, uh, there is still a system, uh, systemic view of older people as tied to vulnerability, sameness, and low expectations for older adult lives. And we've seen that right across the pandemic, where our default set setting seems to be paternalism uh, and sometimes is even a little bit discriminatory in terms of how we uh, set up our language and our attitudes. Third, substantial equality still persists. So social connectivity, digital exclusion, civic participation, all of these issues are still there and perhaps more ingrained now uh, over the last few months. Fourth, we still overlook the perspectives of the most marginalized and diverse groups of older adults. And this is really a key issue and an issue around intersectionality that we have to try and embrace. Fifth, we continue to lack policy frameworks that really integrate voice and ensure fair and effective uh, resource allocation. So all of these aspects really are elements that we are going to be picking up within this module. It is going to be about trying to understand the construction implications of exclusion. It is going to be uh, about trying to understand the role of policy. And it is going to be about trying to understand the measurement approaches that are best to underpin that uh, uh, um, policy as well. Okay, so with that, I'm going to stop my share and I'm going to ask our second speaker, Eamon O'Shea, to uh, come on and share his screen and to begin the second mini lecture, which will focus on dynamics of aging in public policy and particularly around new directions in home care. Yeah, so I want to talk about a particular aspect of uh, public policy, which is um, in the news a little bit in the last few years in particular, but it's an ongoing issue here in, in Ireland, which is the sort of the mix between residential care and home care for dependent older people in particular. It's a policy, an enduring policy that goes back um, in policy terms to 1966, um, and the Care the Age report and has surfaced every now and then in terms of, in particular, where it's best for older people, particularly dependent older people to age. And um, some of the issues uh, have to do with costs. And sometimes the debate is framed in costs in terms of the resource allocation costs of nursing homes versus um, uh, home-based care. but. Part of the issue, um, I think, is in terms of um, the demographic dividend, if you like, uh, which is um, the number of older people that we have right now is, is increasing, uh, which is a good thing. And I think if you look in particular, uh, whether you focus on, on, on specific aspects of dementia, for example, the number of older people are increasing, particularly if you look at the figure, the number of older people who are 65 uh, and 65 plus, you'll find that from 1990, males and females, the number of years, this is on average, was 13 years for males and 17 years for females. You can see the increase in the demographic dividend between 1990 and 2016. Now, if you're age 65 and male, you have you have an extra five years, and similarly with females, you have an extra uh, four years. So one of the things that's happening is that um, the median age of the population is rising, but also uh, the number of people age 65 and over are increasing. And this is a good thing because it reflects, obviously, uh, increasing life expectancy, but it does raise interesting issues to do with policy. Um, and some of the issues, unfortunately, will mean that as people, as we have increased the number of people over 65, the number of dependent older people will also increase. And that has implications for resource needs. 
And you see in this slide right now that um, this is taken from the um, Department of Health Capacity Report from a couple of years back. By 2031, the over 65 will generate half of all healthcare activity. And you'll see over the next 10 years, you see the, the resource implications there. It's 46% increase in demand for primary care, 39% increase in residential care beds, and a 70% increase in demand for home care. Uh, and also for, and then also increase for inpatient episodes in public hospitals. So this is sometimes where the debate gets rooted. Uh, sometimes it's, 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 it's almost stereotyping of age that, you know, that really aging is to be feared because of the burden it places, not just on in individuals, because the burden it places on society. But I think if you think about these issues, I think you need to think about them a little bit differently. Uh, and you need to put the person, the older person, the older dependent person at the center of the debate. And that's where the continuum of care comes in and basic question, uh, where should older dependent people um, be looked after? And the op there's an obvious answer in one sense, uh, which the 1987 Years Ahead report told us that as far as possible and practical, older people should be looked after at home. One of the difficulties has been, however, that um, since 1987 and before, policy has not always followed that in terms of the allocation of resources to make that happen. So the continuum of care then is interesting because if you look at it on the screen right now, and I'm not going to go through each of them in, in detail, um, if you look at the last item, um, is where most of the debate has been centered over the last 20 years. And indeed, when when big policies just come up, they tend to focus on nursing homes, on residential care beds, on long-term care beds, on you know, uh, the fair deal scheme and the cost of the fair deal scheme. But if you look at the broad brush on the continuum of care, you'll see the continuum of care is much more interesting, much more complex, and potentially much more innovative. Um, from modifying the adapted own home, to boarding out, to communal, residential, co-housing communities, in particular to housing with social care and technological supports. And interestingly, technology uh, is going to really uh, throw up some interesting and uh, potential pathways to innovation for home care. But you can see the whole range of the continuum that's in front, that's in front of us there, which makes home care policy a lot more interesting than simply a simple dichotomy between caring for a person in their own home and caring for a person in a nursing home bed. There's lots lots in between and that's where that's where really interesting stuff happens um, so why is this issue of home care important well it's important because as i said earlier there's a bias towards nursing home care it's important because we traditionally have a very weak social model here in ireland we tend to think we tend generally although this is changing to think about uh, home uh, dependent older people in medical terms and for many people there are, of course there are medical uh, questions but there are also really important social questions. And we've seen those social questions come alive in the last year with the COVID crisis, when people were uh, thinking about loneliness for older people and exclusion as Kieran says for older people and the absence of older people from debates, essentially debates about themselves, uh, which is curious to have older people absent from these debates, but they were in many cases. We've also have new home care legislation pending uh, at the moment on a new home care bill, uh, which has the capacity to uh, revolutionize home care and to really make the next 10 years really interesting. We have Staunch Care as well, who's committed to sort of a home, home care, primary care, community care focus, uh, which over the next five to 10 years uh, will also shed some interesting light on new directions and in innovation. As Kieran also mentioned, we have the COVID-19 legacy and responses pending because, you know, we still have to really think about what happened over the past year, particularly in the early days. Uh, not necessarily as a way of, of, of criticism, but as a way of learning lessons and a way of learning lessons about, about placement for older people. We also have the ongoing thing that really shouldn't be taken for granted. Although we as a society, implicitly I think, uh, think about familial responsibility as being central to the care of older people, we haven't really, really explored that and we haven't thought about it for the future because I think that can't be taken for granted. Uh, the numbers of older, the numbers of uh, care checker potential is likely to fall. 
labor force participation of women is increasing and will increase further. And I think we may be looking at caretaker potential uh, declining uh, and therefore uh, less family carers. And of course, the future funding models are also important because if you have an increase, uh, for example, uh, number of people with dementia increasing threefold over the next 20 years. You have the ongoing increase in the older population. You know, the question has to come up about how and uh, and where we can we, we can fund this. So that's recognized by the policy system. The special committee on COVID-19, the Oireachtas Committee came up with a few uh, points, policy points, and I think they mirror what this earlier slide I just put up. They, they talked about the need for integration, the need for shifting the focus of care from congregated settings, essentially nursing homes, going that goes back to the continuum of care, nuances and models for independent living, goes back again to the continuum of care, supported housing, um, integration of the private nursing home into the broader public care, enactment of the legislation I just talked about under the statute of provision of care, and a single source funding. All of these are live policy issues really important policy issues and have the potential to change the landscape, which we, these are the type of things that I think are really exciting and uh, we will be covering in the, uh, in the, uh, on the course. This is just, of course, one taster of what potentially is in the course. Uh, just and finally on, the, on this, it really is related to, but I think separate also to um, uh, home care and so on, and that is funding models. As I said, mostly rely on families at the moment. Some countries tend to think about the market and personal responsibility. Uh, probably the US is probably the best example. But then in between, you have the potential for private insurance, the role of general taxation in funding long-term care, the potential of a new social insurance model where you have intergenerational solidarity in a sense, uh, copper facet, if you like. And then you have interesting issues that are about to come up, particularly with the new home care legislation, and that's to do with co-payment. Uh, whether, whether, for example, there will be co-payment in any developed home care model or provision in Ireland. We're doing research on all of these things here in NUI Gala, which is why uh, I think this course is interesting generally because uh, much of the topics we're covering will be research-based, our own research, but also, as Kieran says previously, drawn in international literature as well. But this is a research, a, a research focused uh, centres here in, in NUI Galway and I think that's why uh, if you're thinking of coming here uh, you will be right at the core of you know uh, of, of contemporary research uh, and innovative research in regards to older people including people with dementia. Uh, just finally for me uh, my last slide here <coughs> excuse me um, on the learning outcomes um, and uh, I think demography has to be central to policy and both nationally and internationally. Um, economics is central, the second one, and longitudinal the, the aspects. Of course, we have tilde now, which uh, a lot of information is coming out. We have shared data, we have comparative data. Uh, so we're well able to think about the economic aspects of, 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 of aging and the role of older people and the purchasing power of older people. Understanding the policy levers of government, you know, what governments do, how they make policy, uh, and the role of uh, PPI, for example, uh, public patient involvement in policy, which is really a hot topic in terms of uh, future policy making. Uh, and as I said, they're including pensions, labor market. I think Anya is going to talk uh, in a while about some of those issues. Because I'm an economist, there's going to be thinking about resource allocation for decision making and funding models that I just as I just talked about and then because I'm um, uh, uh, part of the uh, Centre for Economic and Social Research on dementia here uh, we will do a specific focus on dementia. The last five years of my research has been on dementia uh, and that's why we'll be having this uh, a particular module on that within within our program. So what I'd say to you, if you're thinking about coming here and doing this, this is as uh, new, it's innovative, it's linked to the international uh, um, debate, discussion on aging. Aging is going to be the most interesting topic in Ireland, in the world, in Europe over the next, over the next 20 years. So really a course like this uh, is at the cutting edge. So I'll stop now and, um, and hand you back to Kieran. 
That's great, Damon. Thank you very much. And I will ask Anya maybe then to uh, share her screen and to begin uh, her own mini lecture. Uh, I should say as well that we will take uh, an extra few minutes at the end just to make up for that technical glitch at the start. Uh, but again, if anybody has to leave, we will uh, answer any questions that you put into the chat bar as we go along. So please, Anya, whenever you're ready. Okay, hello, uh, everybody, and welcome to the Tasters uh, lecture on for the module on work, pensions, and retirement. My name is Anya Nilema, and I'm based at the Irish Centre for Social Gerontology. Um, I'm the module leader for this, and I, my colleague Maureen Maloney from the Discipline of Management will co-teach on it. So in, in today's uh, Tasty session, okay, I'm just trying to... Uh, there we go. Um, I'm, first, I'm going to give a broad outline of the topics covered in work pensions and retirement. And these include pension sustainability, pension adequacy, auto enrollment, work patterns and issues for older workers, and various reforms to uh, pensions and work policy. So I'll discuss why are these important for policy. And um, in the module, then we highlight the importance of adopting a critical perspective on policy and analysing inequalities across different groups of workers and over the life course. Um, so today I'm going to focus on extended working life policy as an example of a topical current issue in policy and then I'll discuss uh, considerations for the future. So um, to begin, then, in the case of older workers' pensions and retirement, uh, the major uh, important development really is the phenomenon of population aging. And uh, so, because life expectancy has increased, policymakers are increasingly concerned about how the sustainability and adequacy of public pensions, in particular. Uh, in this module, we'll discuss what this means for workers in the future uh, and citizens. So, for example, it, it appears if, that if governments continue uh, on, their, on their current policy uh, agenda, that people will be working until the age of 70. So we'll look at debates in Ireland, uh, such as that on the issue of extended working life and auto-enrolment. We'll consider government and employer policies as well, and uh, draw on workers' perspectives. And some of that will be coming from um, current uh, research that's international research uh, part of here at the centre. So as I've mentioned, population ageing is an international phenomenon. People are living longer and uh, concern about being able to sustain national pensions has become an important issue, uh, especially for international policy organisations such as the OECD and the European Commission. Um, and then it's also for national governments. So the fact that the Irish government has set up a pensions commission, uh, which is currently uh, uh, um, preparing a report, which will be out in June, that emphasizes how topical this issue is. And it was a major issue in the last election. Um, so it, it also it shapes people's patterns of work and it has a big impact on well-being for older workers and well-being in retirement because if people don't have adequate pensions, then they're going to be at risk of poverty and retirement. So when we think, think about, uh, I said I was gonna look specifically at extended working life. So when we think about extended working life, um, it's often we, we think of people who you know, can fairly easily, they're in, in rewarding, interesting jobs and they can continue in those types of jobs without too much difficulty after age 65. They're not necessarily physically demanding. But if we think about people working in these kinds of jobs here on the right hand side, uh, fishermen, uh, people in construction and other industries, uh, it's often very difficult or if not impossible for them to keep working after age 65. So um, the OECD has been promoting extended working life policy since 2006 with the publication of its uh, report to live longer, work longer, which is kind of what it says on the tin. Um, and the main policy uh, measure that they, they recommend is to increase state pension age and a range of other measures as well to uh, 
you know, to encourage people to work longer or to not retire. Uh, there, it has been pointed out, though, that these are one size fits all policies. And uh, however, people are, are not homogenous. And this type of policy affects groups of workers very differently. So people in those physically demanding jobs that I showed you uh, often find it very difficult to work for longer. And then women, there's a major uh, gender pension gap, which is higher than the gender pay gap. Um, so women tend to have much lower pension provision. And uh, precarious workers then also have uh, an issue with um, pensions because uh, often it's not possible for them to get jobs due to age discrimination if they lose their job at an older age. So looking at uh, the kind of policies that have been introduced in Ireland, so pension reforms were, uh, a, a range of pension reforms were introduced in 2012. So the major one there was the raising of state pension age to 66 in 2014. And that was due to increase to uh, 67 in 2021, that's this year, and 68 in 2028. Um, and there's been a major, as I said, opposition to this. And so th those increases have been suspended for the moment and we're waiting to see what the Pensions Commission uh, will come up with. Other relevant legislation then is anti-age discrimination. Um, but they're, uh, they're, that is very notoriously difficult uh, just type of discrimination to prove. Uh, and there's a code of practice for employers which is on how to deal with employees who maybe want to work longer. Um, because one of the issues is that uh, um, current law um, in Ireland means that people who sign contracts to age 65 uh, often have to retire at that age. And since state pension age is increasing, uh, but for those people, they have to go on job seekers allowance uh, in the meantime. So these are examples of the kind of um, extended working life policies in Ireland. And uh, so the learning outcomes from this course would be to have an understanding of the main policy issues and debates in relation to uh, an extended working life, uh, to look at the international context and the policy drivers, and to develop the ability to critically analyze policies using uh, critical theories of aging, such as a gender political economy of aging, and a life course approach, which uh, looks at kind of cumulative disadvantage over the life course that Kieran already mentioned, and engaging with both quantitative and qualitative evidence from some of the uh, research, the international research projects that we're involved in here at the centre, and looking at both employers, workers, and uh, national policy. So it's getting a really good overview of what's happening. And uh, looking also at being able to analyze prospects for the future. Uh, so for example, uh, seeing whether maybe an integrated approach to policy will be useful and looking at examining good practices internationally. Okay, so thanks very much. And if you have any questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer them later on. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much, Sonia. So, so far we've seen one of these cross-cutting issues around inequalities. We've seen a, a focus specifically on one of the main uh, policy domains around care. And we've seen a, a main area, again, with respect to employment and work, all kind of key elements of participation and engagement. And now from Patricia, uh, Patricia's going to look at some of these issues, particularly around social exclusion, from the perspective of low and middle income countries and again referencing I suppose the internationalization of uh, our focus here in the context of this program. So Patricia whenever you're ready. Um. Okay, I'm going to start again. Good afternoon, everyone, and delighted to be here and to share a flavour with you of what 
I will be covering when I contribute to the module on international policy and aging. I'm focusing today on the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. As Kieran mentioned in the introduction, until very recently, I was working as Global Head of Aging and Advocacy with HelpAge International. And therefore, I bring that perspective in terms of experience of aging, older people and policy in low and middle income countries to the module and to the work that I hope we will be doing together. So in terms of the outline for the session today, broadly, it's under two headings looking at the background in terms of what the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is, uh, why it's important, etc. And then some of the policy considerations before COVID, during COVID, and now looking to the future as we emerge, hopefully, from the COVID pandemic. Agenda 2030 is the world's plan to end poverty, agreed by the United Nations in 2015. It is global, applicable in all countries, high, middle and low income countries. It's inclusive of all ages and it's founded on a central, central pledge to leave no one behind. What's critical is that there is space in this global framework for joint work on ageing and a life course approach. The United Nations is now shifting positively in terms of recognition of ageing, but it's fair to say that traditionally it has not been strong on ageing policy and programming. So th this is a welcome move. And the agenda, the 2030 agenda, has the potential to advance policy mainstreaming of ageing and of older people uh, in all countries of the world, but particularly in low and middle income countries. Um, for background, it's a global framework, it's implemented nationally, and then with voluntary review and reporting by uh, all governments. In terms of uh, older age exclusion in low and middle income countries, uh, globally, we are, as, as other uh, speakers have said to you, seeing major transitions. So, for example, the large share of older people, 37%, now live in Eastern and Southeastern Asia. And this is the part of the world where the speed of population aging is the fastest. So these transitions are going to bring, are bringing immense challenges for policymakers. And I, I'll expand on that point in a moment. Of course, older people in low and middle income countries are not a homogenous group. There is huge variation in their circumstances across geographies, economies, cultures. So of necessity, and please bear with me today, I'm speaking in shorthand for the purpose of this taster lecture. Nonetheless, there are clear patterns in terms of lack of access to rights, income, health services, etc. Uh, across uh, older people's experience in low and middle income countries. For example, worldwide, 68% of people above retirement age have access to an old age pension. In Sub-Saharan Africa, that percentage is just under 23%. And of course, we have interaction between demographic aging and a range of global mega trends and issues, such as climate change, such as COVID-19, as we've been speaking about. And these two have an impact now and in the future on older age uh, and people's experience of, of aging. In terms of some of the policy challenges and considerations, there is, uh, not, not surprisingly perhaps, but, but we have to recognise it, a gap between the vision of 2030, uh, the 2030 agenda, which aims to be a transformative agenda against poverty in favour of equality and policy implementation at the country level. This is particularly the case in the case of older people and even building a, a clear evidence informed picture as to why that is so and what the challenges are is in itself difficult. There are 17 sustainable development goals with global targets and indicators uh, intended to measure progress at a global level. And frequently, these global review targets do not fully count or recognize older people and their experience within the, the, uh, the policy making process. And these are linked, these issues are linked to deficits in statistical systems where older people may be uncounted, 
where data may not be disaggregated by sex, by age, by disability, but particularly by age in this instance, or where data is collected but not publicly reported or disseminated, which has actually been one of the issues in the context of COVID-19 and reporting uh, on COVID levels in different countries. There are troubling, deeply troubling gaps in deficit or in evidence-informed policy making. So in some instances, due to the gaps in statistical systems that I've mentioned to you, also due to failures to apply gerontological research and knowledge to the policy making process, and indeed due to gaps in appreciation of older people's own lived experience and diversity. For a few moments, um, some observations on policy responses to COVID-19, and we know that uh, COVID-19 has most serious consequences in terms of serious illness, for older people in terms of illness and in terms of death. And that was and is a major concern in low and middle income countries where there are immense challenges in terms of access to sanitation, quality of people's housing, all of the things that form part of the public health responses that have been advocated in responding to COVID-19. The United Nations has led a multilateral response to COVID-19 across humanitarian health and development pillars. And I've flagged up some acronyms, so just to explain what the acronyms are. So OCHA is the uh, Office of, for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, leading the humanitarian response. World Health Organization, I think everybody's already familiar with, and UNDP a develop, and the Development Coordination Office would have led responses across our, our leading responses and plans for recovery across socioeconomic development. And the way in which this is working is that you have um, the, the global plans, global guidance, some support around budgets and funding, and an interplay between the global levels and the national levels with UN resident coordinators in different countries aiming to coordinate UN responses in country and work in harmony and support national governments in terms of their responses to COVID-19. So obviously there's a big picture behind all of that, but this is just to give a sense of how the machinery has been operating in, in policy terms or how part of the machinery has been operating during COVID-19. Um, in HelpAge International, uh, uh, we would have done rapid needs responses or rapid needs assessments of how older people were experiencing COVID-19 um, in uh, 12 countries. And the key issues that emerged were lack of income, uh, lack of access to food, and difficulty in accessing medicines, and obviously huge displacement in terms of access to standard health services, which would already have been fragmented. We know from our own experience in Ireland that the effectiveness of public health responses is reliant on uh, trust between citizens and governments, communications, participation. And in relation to older people, they, um, and what has been reported to us uh, 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 around their experiences on the ground, there have frequently been losses in terms of voice, agency, dignity, and life itself, as we know, in terms of high levels of death in care homes. So for reasons behind that being older people's associations unable to meet, uh, failures to consult with older people on the ground, and extreme isolation measures in some cases. So for example, in Buenos Aires in Argentina, it had been intended that older people would have to get a permit to leave their homes for any purpose. There was um, uh, an outcry, civil society and legal action and they, uh, the local authority withdrew on that and, and modified their approach. But that's to give an example. So I want to highlight that at the global level, the calls from uh, bodies and individuals such as the UN Commissioner for Human Rights have really been important in highlighting the need for public health responses to uphold human rights principles and values. And uh, so that has been just a necessary uh, counter, uh, counter voice in terms of some of the discussion that has gone on in relation to COVID. So finally, looking to the future, uh, what I would say is as we are learning, have learned through COVID, are learning now in, in the debate about access to vaccination, no one is safe until everyone is safe. A global pandemic requires a global response. So there, 
we must have this interplay between uh, the global, the national, and across you know, the different regions. In terms of preparedness, response, and recovery strategies, these must be age inclusive based on a new social contract for all. And this is the leadership that's coming from the UN and from the UN Secretary General also. And that contract would include things like universal health coverage, social protection, and inclusive data systems. These components do form part of the Agenda 2030, which I began with. And now the hope is that Agenda 2030 can be a, a framework, framework through which people can hope to build back better, greener and fairer in the future. I want to finish with a reference to the fact that uh, the UN Decade of Healthy Aging has been launched. It is important, I, I really hear what Kieran was saying very accurately about the need to move beyond the prism of looking at older people only through sort of a health lens, if you will. What's very interesting about the, the Decade of Healthy Aging is that it does flag up explicitly the issue of ageism and the need to take action globally and at all levels in relation to ageism. And through some of what we've all been saying today, I think you hear some of the effects of ageism, just, just that unspoken impact on um, how policies are made, how resources are allocated, rooted in the norms and the values that are indeed part of the social exclusion of older people. As to how that will happen, that's the topic for another lecture. For now, that's it from me. Thank you very much for listening. That's great. Thank you so much, Patricia. And what I might ask is for everybody to come back online. And for those who can stay around for a few minutes, we will answer uh, some questions that are coming in. So uh, we can start with just one question. So we'll start with some of the uh, program delivery questions first. So uh, we have a question here. Uh, will the course be delivered on a part-time basis? So yes, it's available on a full-time or part-time basis. And the second part of our question is, if so, what is the weekly commitment in terms of lecture times? So for the part-time option, it's typically one day a week, but that translates between uh, six hours and eight hours of lectures in that one day. So uh, that depends on semester one and semester two. If you're interested, I can certainly send on the timetables uh, or the indicative timetables as they stand at the moment to give you a better sense of, of where those modules uh, lie and what times of the day and so on if you're looking at doing it online. We've also had a question about whether or not we deliver the program uh, through blended learning or uh, online um, process. So at the moment, obviously everything is a little bit up in the air, but for us, we're intending both to, um, if public health guidance permit, to provide the course uh, in situ, face-to-face, uh, -face, but also online to deliver people remote access to live lectures and materials as well. So you have those two options to choose from. What it looks like for now is that semester one, even if you choose to attend here in NUI Galway, um, most of the materials and learning will be online. But again, that's subject to change. Um, so the other question then is, what are the most common uh, kind of career opportunities and professions that people can uh, uh, try and access from this course? So this one, I, I will open up to others as well, but certainly based on a program that we had um, running previously before, uh, there will be a couple of things that we would certainly highlight. One is that, um, Policy analysis and research officers with key civil society organizations and indeed public health agencies, strategic advisors and indeed government planners as well. Uh, leadership roles with respect to uh, government and public bodies, uh, public bodies that are engaged in these sort of activities. Uh, and then uh, a whole series of different service coordinator roles as well. The, the key element here is that for people who are coming from undergraduate uh, degrees, it's primarily about getting transferable skills uh, as well as these topic specific, topic specific skills that allow people to make those choices in terms of what directions um, that people want to go. But again, it is likely that demand will be there for these topic specific skills because this is such a cross cutting uh, policy area. Uh, what I will ask is if anybody else uh, has uh, would like to come in there just in terms of the career side, um, Patricia or Eamon or anybody like that, if you have any other insights in terms of your experiences. Uh, I can just come in uh, briefly, uh, Kieran, and say from the civil society perspective, 
even yet, the number of organizations that are dealing specifically with aging are quite small. However, it is shifting. And what, it, what you will also find now is that more organizations dealing with other issues, whether it's disability, whether it's gender, whether it's civil society engagement, progressive movements, are beginning to look at the aging agenda and to beginning to look at how uh, you know, the issues link up and so on. So I, my expectation would be that that area will grow. So I simply wanted to add that. Okay, very good. And, and certainly, I suppose this is our feeling as well from uh, different sets of agencies across the different sectors so public, private and uh, civil society. Okay, so we do have another question and this is about the international relevance of the programme and its focus on uh, Ireland versus other contexts. So for us, uh, there is obviously an Irish context here that we have to pay attention to, but really what we're trying to uh, create is a programme that is relevant to other international jurisdictions. That's about drawing on international research, but it's also obviously by uh, um, bringing in modules like international aging uh, and policy. I guess one of the things that we can maybe speak to a little bit is about the, the relevance itself of demographic aging uh, to various different contexts. So uh, certainly you can see it in Western developed countries, but also emerging across developing countries as considerations uh, that need to be taken into account with respect to, um, with respect to different policy agendas. Um, I'll just check, I think there's an, another question just in relation aspect. Okay, uh, and then uh, there is also a question here about networking opportunities uh, and what these kind of opportunities uh, might sit within the course. So I'll hand that over to somebody else. So Anya, Eamon or Patricia, if you want to try and uh, answer that one and what in your experience uh, these kind of programs allow people to uh, form these kind of connections and, and networks as well. Um, I'm happy to jump in first. Um, just my own experience of the courses I've been on myself, the groups I've been part of and so on, if you've uh, collaborated with people, um, whether it's in a course or, uh, and, uh, or in a sort of a, an, an intervention together around an issue that you care about, so in this instance, aging, um, then you have those links for the rest of your working life. And there is an aging world and uh, it's not that big globally. And people do connect with great and greater ease than ever before, as we know now remotely and so on. And it is immensely valuable to actually know people in different organizations, in different settings, who have uh, a particular interest in a particular topic and to be able to actually send them an email and say, look, I'm looking for such and such. Can you give me a steer? or you know such a report is coming out this might be of interest I, I, for myself it's been enormously valuable and i would anticipate that that would be the case with this course also okay uh, thank you patricia uh, and then we have a couple of other questions that we'll try and get to before the uh, 10 minute mark so we have one here just in relation to uh, what requirements are needed to enter this course so this is typically um, uh, in terms of a, a 2 1 undergraduate degree or, or more. Uh, what I would encourage you to think about though is that if you have specific experience or uh, specific interests that uh, illustrate your commitment to these kind of areas, I would certainly make contact with us if you don't fulfill that criteria. Uh, the undergraduate degree doesn't have to be in a specific discipline, but I would suggest it's an ally discipline. Uh, so far, from the people that we've had conversations with, We've had people coming from a health professional background, we've people coming from a technology background, people coming from sociology background and economics as well. So there is a multitude of different uh, backgrounds that are, are very much uh, relevant to the sort of uh, uh, topics that we'll be covering uh, as well. And I think you might've seen that uh, from today. So the final question then that we'll just deal with while we're all online here and we can answer as others if, if needs be afterwards is around the placement and uh, what that involves. So essentially we're offering uh, three different variations of that placement. Uh, the placements are going to be geared at national organizations. So these are organizations that are 
public agencies, uh, civil society organizations operating at that national level, or private organizations and private associations in the care and in other sectors related to that as well. So number one is uh, page placements. Uh, so these will be um, allocated on a competitive basis. Excuse me. Um, and uh, they're very much tying somebody to uh, a particular placement organization for up to 12 weeks. That's where you complete your research, applied research project, but you might also engage in other research activity as well. Then we offer a voluntary uh, internship, uh, which might suit people who have other forms of employment that would like the experience of working in other organizations. Again, this would be tied to the applied research project, um, but it can be certainly fulfilled remotely. And then we do offer people, particularly from uh, coming in from a part-time situation who are perhaps working in organizations related and connected to the field, to uh, build their own project in around their own work as well. And certainly that's something that we work with people to try and uh, engage in trying to still ensure that the same sort of learning outcomes are matched. For the first two placement options, you will also have a, a supervisor based within those organizations. So it's also about building relationships and connections with people there. So on that basis, I think what we'll do now is we'll draw uh, today's section to, uh, the, uh, to a close. Apologies again for the glitch that happened at the beginning of the session, but I hope and I'm glad that everybody could stay with us. If you have any other questions, please do not hesitate to contact us. Um, we will uh, put up a recording of this session on the master's website. So that's the master's in aging and public policy at NUI Galway. If you want further information, or please do email me if you need any further details as well. And we'll stick up some holding slides there that will provide you with some of those details. So for now, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you to all our speakers. And uh, I hope you've got a good sense of what the program will deliver. Take care, mind yourself. Thank you.